Let's start with your prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Heavenly Father, it seems like our world is coming apart. But we know you're in the thick of it. We know you got this. We know you're stirring your people up for something to do good and create a whole new reality, we hope, where your love prevails. Help us to be the agents of your love. And here today from Wade and Mary, giving them great thanks for sharing their gifts in this way, as they teach us more about the Holy Spirit, which is the agent that empowers us to love and change the world. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to surprise you guys with the Holy Spirit throughout here, you know? You're on. Good morning, Resurrection. Uh, hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, many of you actually will know us, but for uh, in case anybody is watching who hasn't met us before, uh, I'm Wade and this is my wife, Mary Hinkle. Uh, we're members of uh, Holy Cross Episcopal Church uh, on Loring, uh, down the road from you guys. Uh, although we have actually taught at Resurrection uh, for Adult Forum a fair amount. Uh, and I am also uh, the, one of the co-mentors of the Education for Ministry group that meets at St. John's Episcopal Church, also down the road from you all. Do we know anybody who attends that group? Uh, let's say, well, we have in the past had people from uh, Resurrection and Cat, uh, of course, is uh, still a student. Um, we're, we have just finished that actually the uh, academic semester for the year. Like everybody else, we were we spent the last 90 days learning how to do classes over Zoom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, today, Joe had asked if we would um, gather some information and pre present some concepts and discussion on the idea of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's something uh, I, I know why Joe wants lay people to do this, because anytime an ordained clergy speaks on the Holy Spirit, she's in mortal fear of getting defrocked. <laughs> So there's, a, there's a heresy waiting at every turn. Right. So um, it's uh, safer to have lay people uh, do it. Uh, so what we hope to do this morning, we're going to divide our, our presentation basically into about two parts. Um, I'm going to talk about the Jewish and Islamic tradition in regard to the Holy Spirit and the fact that there is a Jewish and Islamic tradition about the Holy Spirit may actually be news uh, to people. Uh, and we'll transition there about halfway through the presentation, and Mary will talk about how the concept of Holy Spirit uh, emerged in Christianity and has developed um, over time. Uh, I guess we'll invite people to please ask questions as we go. Uh, I'm not sure how big the Zoom meeting is going to be, but uh, we'll we'll try to deal with, uh, with it. So this will be a little bit more of a college lecture than it normally is when we're at Resurrection, but we'll try to keep it interactive. Uh, and Joe, I guess we're going to call for slide advance uh, as we need. So if we, next slide, please. Oh, and I think you've, you've got animation that you're going to have to, another, yeah. The, the, the animation actually was added by <clears throat> our good friends at Resurrection after we sent uh, Joe's slide. Uh, so here's where we're going. We're going to talk first about the basic concept of the idea of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as I said, the interesting piece of news today for you may be the fact that there is a basis in both uh, Jewish tradition and Islamic tradition uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then uh, second half of the presentation, we'll talk about how it has emerged in Christianity. Uh, and then we'll tell you what we told you at the end. Next slide, please. Now, here's uh, to start off with, you get to learn a new word, pneumatology. So it, it turns out that pneumatology is actually a formal academic discipline in schools of theology, and it simply means the study of the concept of the Holy Spirit, pneumatology. Why is it called pneumatology? Well, uh, there's several different um, derivations of the word or phrase Holy Spirit. Uh, partly, it proceeds from the Greek pneuma, breath. Remember, Holy Spirit breathed life um, into creation. Uh, it's from the Latin spiritus, and there's an old English derivation, also gost, which is what we call Nick. 
which is why we call it the Holy Ghost. Actually, it's the Holy Ghost uh, rather than the Holy Ghost. Um, and all, all three um, language sources are, are really conveying the idea of breath or animating spirit or the soul. Now, thanks to my wonderful VTS education in Biblical Hebrew, I can also talk about uh, how you find the concept of Holy Spirit in Hebrew, and you find it in the phrase Ruach HaKodash, which means breath or wind, and is most commonly translated into uh, English as Holy Spirit. Uh, you see a little artwork there, that's the Pentecost um, happening over on your right. Uh, one of the more prominent appearances of the Holy Spirit, uh, but that's Christianity. Let's talk about Judaism first. Next slide. If you want to know more about pneumatology, there are now lots of different academic resources that are available for further study. Uh, so get a copy of the electrons for the slide uh, from uh, Joe Lenore. This is one of many websites that you could actually consult uh, if you would actually like to know more about the academic discipline of pneumonology. Next slide. So let's talk about Judaism and Islam. Next slide. So you can actually find in the Old Testament, there are three specific references to the phrase Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, and they happen in Psalm uh, 51 and in Isaiah chapter uh, 63. So that particular phrase, the Holy Spirit, actually appears three different times in Hebrew scripture. Now, there are similar but not uh, identical terms that actually appear more frequently and arguably are also talking about the Holy Spirit. And that is Ruach Elohim, Ruach Adonai, which is what the capital letters there uh, mean, Yahweh and Yahweh. Ruach Hakma. Now you'll find these references uh, frequently in Genesis and Samuel and the prophets. Um, so Ruach Elohim means basically spirit of God. Uh, Ruach uh, Adonai means spirit of the Lord God. Uh, and Ruach Hakma means uh, sort of God's wisdom or, or intent. Next slide. Now, why are there different kind of references uh, to the same term? So uh, sometime back, we actually did a class at Resurrection where we talked about who actually wrote the Old Testament. And long story short, as is summarized on this particular slide, the predominant thought over the last 150 years is that there are four principal authorships or voices that you hear in the Old uh, Testament. And those are called the J, the E, the D, and the P source. Um, so the J source is called the Yahweh source uh, or Adonai. Uh, and it basically was written by authors who followed the Hebrew tradition of not fully spelling out God's name, which is why you're only seeing the consonants rather than uh, the vowels. Um, and basically, when the, in the J source, when you can tell you're reading the J source, God is talking directly to humans in the J source. That's the principal way to tell. The Elohim source is basically God using intermediaries uh, to talk to uh, humans. The Deuteronomist, uh, basically, uh, it, the Deuteronomist writing is basically a focus on prophets interpreting the law. And the P or priestly authors uh, basically are the people who are talking about the rights of the clergy and please save the best cuts of meat for the clergy and, uh, and things like that. So it is the J and the E authors uh, who include the references that you see uh, throughout the Old Testament um, uh, to the Spirit of God. So both of these authors uses one or more of the phrases that you saw on the, on the previous slide. Both mention the, so the idea of the spirit of God. And so the interesting question that arises, particularly for us as Christians is, is this the same thing as the Holy Spirit? Next slide. So if you read the scholarship 
basically on the meaning of the use of the idea of God's spirit in, in the Old Testament. Uh, basically, I think this slide is a pretty fair representation of, of the, all the literature taken together. So the first thing from an Old Testament perspective is the Judaic Holy Spirit or Spirit of God is an attribute of God. It's not God, God's self. So it's a characteristic or an attribute of God, um, but not God incarnated. It's generally associated with prophecy. So a lot as, as and a, a lot of this is basically uh, the inspiration of the prophets. Uh, you know, all of them are all portrayed as sitting around minding their own business in the field and God come, the Holy Spirit comes up and whaps them on the side of the head and uh, suddenly they're uh, prophetic. Now, associated with this commissioning of the prophets is the Excellent. idea that, that, that God's Holy Spirit can rest upon individuals. And that, in fact, is uh, the, motiv the motivation and authority that the prophets are carrying around with them uh, as they prophesy. Uh, so you also learn when you <clears throat> look through the Old Testament that in essence, uh, Jewish tradition holds that the scriptures themselves are the visible work of the Holy Spirit. They've been inspired by the Spirit of God. Uh, and so that's one, one lasting piece of evidence of the presence of God's Spirit uh, is scriptures. So interestingly enough, uh, when you take all this together, there is a very strong Jewish tradition about the Holy Spirit, not the same as ours, uh, because we're Trinitarian um, and Jesus hasn't happened yet in the Old Testament, uh, but um, uh, not far, not very, uh, the alignment I think is actually uh, pretty close. The more surprising thing to you might be to hear that there's a strong tradition of the Holy Spirit in Islam. Next slide. Through al Quds, uh, which is the Islamic translation of the phrase Holy Spirit, Ruh means spirit or soul. There are four different citations in the Quran uh, specifically to this phrase and the use of the idea of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> uh, three of them are specifically linked to Jesus um, in the Quran. Um, there's also some association of the idea of Holy Spirit with angels, especially uh, the angel Gabriel. Right, uh, and uh, one piece of evidence of that, as you can see, to at least on the left on my screen, uh, the artwork uh, that is actually uh, a soul symbolized as an angel. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, interestingly enough, um, you actually can get a portrait of the Holy Spirit in uh, Islamic tradition, even though you can't get portraits of people. Next slide. So here are the four places that you can find in the Quran uh, uh, where the Holy Spirit is specifically uh, cited. Uh, and as I mentioned, three of them basically are explaining from the Islamic perspective that the Holy Spirit actually inspired Jesus because Jesus and their tradition was a prophet. And one of the important functions of God's spirit is to uh, give the gift of prophecy to the prophets. And so in the Islamic tradition, they suppose that Jesus must have been motivated in the same way that the other prophets were. And there are three specific descriptions, therefore, in the Quran, uh, which explain how that happened. Two of them are nearly identical uh, in uh, the second shura. Uh, and in the fifth shura, uh, basically, uh, that's God talking to Jesus to remind Jesus of, of uh, how he was gifted uh, uh, by God. Uh, and then uh, the 16th Shura uh, talks about um, bringing God's truth to Muhammad, uh, the last of the, of the great prophets. Uh, so very interestingly enough, remember this is written 700 years after uh, Christ. Uh, so they were aware of the existence of Christ. They were aware, to some extent, probably, of the evolution of Christian thinking about the Holy Spirit, and it's present in Islamic tradition also, although in a way that stands next to the Christian tradition, but of, of course, 
is distinguish it by from it uh, by clearly uh, and their perception of Jesus himself. Next slide. Next slide. Lost her head. Okay. This is where I come in. Um, we'll have Wade jump in as necessary because he fiddled with the slides. And so, oh, you're supposed to be doing this part still. Yeah. Yeah. Trinity, this is still yeah. you. Okay. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> it's still him. Right. Um, so you remember, uh, I think we actually did a presentation at Resurrection uh, sometime back on the concept of the, of the Trinity. Uh, but for those who didn't hear that or might want a quick refresher, as we start talking about the concept of the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, the important thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that this is an important component of the overall thought that we have a Trinitarian Godhead. Right? So uh, it was uh, Athanasius, uh, I think, who first uh, asserted the idea of the equality of the Trinity, that it's God in three different uh, manifestation, but one God, uh, and that Jesus is consubstantial with God, uh, and also Mary. Uh, so that's the idea, the, the, the three-person to nature of the Godhead. Uh, next slide. So the uh, Trinity for dummies, as it says here, um, these are the slides that we were actually using at uh, Resurrection the last time that we um, talked about it. Uh, and so the idea is basically is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is God, fully and completely God, as is God the Father and God the Son. Next slide. So. The important thing uh, to remember is that none of these manifestations of God made the other. The Father is not the Son, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. Next slide. The Son is not the Father and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Next slide. The Holy Spirit is not the Father and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. Next slide. All right. Now, this is, this is where I'm supposed to actually take over. Okay. So. Now we'll talk about um, the concept of the Holy Spirit in the Christian um, scriptures and, and kind of beyond. And so there aren't really very many references to the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. Um, it shows up twice in Matthew, once in Mark. Um, Jesus refers to the advocate twice in John and uses Holy Spirit to define that term one time. So you know, the advocate that is the Holy Spirit. And that's really it, except for in Luke and Acts. Um, so you'd think it's there all the time, but it's not. Not in the sense of actually saying Holy Spirit. Um, so it shows up a lot more um, in Luke and Acts, and we'll get to that in a minute. But remember that um, that's supposed to be New Testament. Um, the drafting order of the New Testament is that Paul's letters predate um, the Gospels. And so Paul's letters have way more references. He talks a lot about the Holy Spirit, um, but they were, but that was written before the Gospels. And so clearly the concept was out there and we can sort of, I think, speculate, at least I do, that the reason it doesn't show up all the time in the Gospels per se is because they're trying to be um, an authentic representation in each, in each gospel tradition of what Jesus actually said. And Jesus just didn't refer to that a whole lot. And so we get a lot of it from Paul, but not so much um, from the gospels. Okay, now next slide. So in Luke and Acts, you get a lot more of this. Um, and this is a, um, a painting of Luke, the evangelist writing his, his um, scriptures. And, a, and as you, I'm throwing this out just because I know that everybody knows this, but it's the same author. It's assumed by scholars to be one author, Luke and Acts. So um, there are actually 17 references in Luke, which is a lot more than you get um, in the other gospels. Um, and what does he say about the spirit? A lot of it is associated with language and prophecy. And so the scholarly 
conclusion is that Jesus, in using the, the term the Holy Spirit, is developing the Judaic concept into something more evolved and that suits his, his message. Um, it's really interesting, though, when you look at, and when you look back at that idea of the, the Jewish idea of Holy Spirit resting upon a prophet and the language coming out. And, and I, I actually um, <clears throat> did a paper on this once um, at, uh, at a class at, um, at VTS. And so in all these times in Luke in which the Holy Spirit touches people, they just burst out with praise and rejoicing and prophecy. And it's just really notable. So, um, and it comes out most often in um, and explicitly in the, the infancy narrative in Luke. I keep vanishing from the camera. Um, so Elizabeth, for example, um, you know, when, when, when Mary walks in pregnant, Elizabeth exclaims loudly and um, blesses Mary in the fruit of her womb because she's moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, we know that Mary has already had the Holy Spirit visit and rest upon her um, to impregnate her, and so she responds to Elizabeth in this outpouring of prophetic verse that we call the Magnificat, with all that powerful imagery oh, about yeah. overturning expectations to fulfill God's promise to Israel. Um, Zechariah, when he gets his power mm -hmm. speech back after he, you know, um, says that the baby's going to be called John, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophecies also. And like Mary, he foresees the salvation of God's people through the covenant. Um, when Mary and Joseph take the infant Jesus to the temple, Simeon is there, and the Holy Spirit has rested upon Simeon, and he has been promised by the Spirit explicitly that he would live to see the Messiah. And so he is guided by the Spirit to go at the right moment, it's what Luke tells us, to the temple. And then he praises God for letting him have this vision of salvation. And it's notable that here we see where I talked about sort of an evolution of the idea of the Holy Spirit from the Judaic concept. Simeon's prophecy expands the promise of salvation from Israel to the Gentiles, to the whole world, to everybody explicitly. So we see that happening there. Um, Anna is not explicitly noted by Luke as being moved by the Holy Spirit, but that presence seems to be implied. She's also praising God very fully and speaking words about Jesus as an infant that come right after Simeon. And there's lots of places in Luke where, even if he doesn't use the term explicitly Holy Spirit, there are linkages to language um, in, in a lot of the miracles that we interpret as having happened through the Holy Spirit. And so the paralytic who's lowered down through the rooftop walks away glorifying God. Um, the dead man from Nain speaks right after Jesus tells him to rise up. Um, the demoniac in the country of the Gerasenes walks away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The woman who's healed of the hemorrhage declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched the hem of Jesus's robe. Um, when Jesus exercises a demon from a mute man, he gains the power of speech again. So we see this happening repeatedly in which the Holy Spirit gives words, sometimes literally the physical power of speech to those whom it touches. And then Jesus again talks about this in Luke chapter 12 when he tells his disciples, do not worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you ought to say. So we see this language part coming up again and again um, and, and inspiring people. Um, and it happens again, of course, in Acts as well. And so where there are 56 references to the Holy Spirit. So Luke continues um, in writing his second chapter of his, of his gospel, um, which you could almost call the Acts of the Holy Spirit rather than the Acts of the Apostles because it's the Holy Spirit driving the apostles to do all those things. Next slide. So the Holy Spirit in Luke and Acts is defined in various ways. Um, it's the activity and presence of God in some references. 
In others, it seems like a more impersonal force or power. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, it comes, he, the Holy Spirit emerges consistently through Jesus' biography, the birth narrative, the baptismal narrative when the Spirit descends upon him like a dove, the temptation when the Spirit drives him into the wilderness, um, and then throughout his ministry, uh, he's driven from that. And the Christian community, as described in Acts chapter 2, arises out of that common experience of the Spirit. Obviously, if we had done this presentation on the original date, we'd be looking forward to Pentecost, but we know what happens at Pentecost. There's a shared experience of the Spirit. It rests upon a whole group of people at one time, and they all then, again, that language, the language bursts out of them, and their hearers hear various languages. And so that's where the community comes from and builds from. And so um, it's a, it, it begins to shape in a way that it didn't do in, in the Judaic tradition as the Christian tradition moves it forward. Um, and, and we see this happening again and again in all the key points throughout Luke's gospel, the Holy Spirit shows up every time something is happening. Um, that's what's going on. Okay, next slide. So again, um, this is just a reminder. You've seen this one before from us, um, the timeline about the New Testament. Um, so there's the dates of Jesus' actual lifetime. Um, 30 to 40 years later, we start getting Paul's letters writing. Then um, the Gospels all come later. Um, and so again, there's the, 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 just to reinforce the idea that um, most of the references to the Holy Spirit coming out of Paul um, actually predate the writing of the Gospels. Um, but again, we have to kind of, I think, assume that what's in the Gospels per se reflects that Gospel tradition's understanding of what Jesus actually said. Okay, next slide. And this one also, I think, is familiar to you from things we've done before. Um, which letters that um, are pretty much undisputed that Paul was the author, um, the, the four that are debated, and then some apocryphal ones and some doubtful ones and some false attributions. Um, so a whole bunch of different things going on there um, in which, but these are important because when we, aside from the mentions in Luke, this is where we get our idea of the Holy Spirit. And this is where we get our idea you notice that Luke didn't really, there's a couple of places where the Holy Spirit is a, is a manifestation of God rather than an impersonal spirit. But for the most part, the idea we have as Trinitarians that the Holy Spirit is a person of God comes out of Paul, not out of the Gospels, because it doesn't come up there. So these are our sources, um, better and, and worse, um, for the idea, the concept that we have about the Holy Spirit. Okay, next slide. There, okay. So, what's the next one? Um, so, when Paul talks about the Holy Spirit, um, it comes up in 1 Thessalonians, which is probably the first letter he actually wrote. Um, he talks about having received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Um, he makes a reference in there later in that, in that letter to God who giveth his Holy Spirit unto you. Um, in other letters in Romans, the Holy Spirit is described as shaping people. And so we start getting a much more important idea from Paul of how we're supposed to think about the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason that the Holy Spirit has become, in a lot of cases, a very divisive issue in the history of the church. Because, um, and again, that makes sense. It's, it is in many ways a new concept. It's a, it's a concept developed from a Judaic base, but goes in a very different direction, um, just as the idea of a three-person God is a very different direction um, from the strict monotheism um, of Judaic belief. And so um, there's been a lot of dispute and a lot of division in the church throughout history. Um, there's a 
a, a lot of commentary you can read where the title is essentially, did Paul make up the Holy Spirit? Right, and I think our next slide, Joe, has a couple of references to that. Let's see. Yes, so here's just a couple of examples of people who say, yes, um, what Paul says about the Holy Spirit is not just his opinion, it's, it's authoritative, it comes from an apostle, it's an, it's an instruction. There are other people who think that, um, this is, that Paul just makes this stuff up, basically. Um, I actually saw another one that, that Wade sent me a reference in which the basic premise of the entire piece was that um, Paul never really had a conversion. He was in there as a fifth column to try to um, subvert Christianity. So you get some real extreme views on Paul. And since most of our understanding of the Holy Spirit comes from him, you get this sense of why it is so controversial. And we are not gonna get into like deep theological argument about this stuff today. Just wanted to make you aware that that is out there and that among the issues that have divided the church and, and created heresies, um, this is one of the big ones, is what is the relationship of the, you know, are there three persons? How do they relate? Um, what, you know, this, the, whether they're the same substance or not. Those types of issues all come out of this concept. So now we'll do something a little bit lighter if we go to the next slide. So let's, we can talk about some symbols. Um, so some of these you know very well. Um, the, um, the dove, this is um, a stained glass. Where is the stained glass at? Okay, this, this is about from about 1660. I forget where the stained glass is, but it, it, I think sometimes we're so accustomed to these symbols and so used to them, we don't think about them deeply. And so, yes, the symbol is, um, it's a, it, the dove is peace and renewed life. The dove comes back to Noah in the ark and brings the twig back at the same time. If you look closely at the Gospels and, it, and Jesus instructing people to go do what they're supposed to do out of, out of the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomic law, doves get sacrificed on the altar in the temple. So they are both a gift of peace and a sacrifice. So you get both. And delicious. <laughs> so you get both joy and sorrow out of the dove symbol. Um, next slide. The, uh, the flames. You know, we're used to this one too. Um, um, but again, this is also got a dual nature. Um, it is the sacrificial fire that will burn away dross and purify us. Um, and it's a test and all that. At the same time that it is light and warmth, the hearth, the, the, an element that we need for life. Um, so you get these very um, rich ideas that I don't think we always think about in, in when we're doing our Pentecostal celebrations, for example. Um, next slide. So this is, um, this is a 19th, no, excuse me, a 15th century Russian icon that shows um, the Holy Spirit as a ray of light coming down. Um, we're, we're familiar with that one too. It's kind of a variant on the fire theme, um, but that is one that is, is distinct from um, fire in, for most scholars who do this kind of thing. And there's some other ones. Next slide. Um, the water of baptism links back to the Holy Spirit. Um, the idea of anointing with oil is another concept in which the Holy Spirit comes in in, in Christian ceremony. Wind, of course, with the, the, the breath of God at creation blowing over the face of the waters and bringing creation out of um, chaos and waters. And there's um, one more that I just like a lot. The Celtic Christians actually um, symbolized the Holy Spirit as the wild goose, not the tan goose, but the wild goose. Um, and I'm not going to even begin to attempt to um, pronounce the Gaelic for that, but th the point is they deliberately chose a goose as opposed to the traditional um, symbol of the dove as a bird because it was more free than the dove. Um, for the Celtic Christians, doves were to a large extent, I mean, they were raised and domesticated um, as fowl that you kept to eat, um, whereas the wild goose um, was more free and 
had powers that the dove didn't have. And so that was why you got this as a, um, as a symbol with the Celtic Christians. Okay, next slide. Um, this is a lovely um, Caravaggio still life with fruit. And that's because um, I wanted to make sure we talked a little bit about the fruits of the Holy Spirit as listed in Galatians. Just misspelled. Um, and so these are, there are different lists of this. They're not all exactly the same, but this is, this is the one that's actually in the scripture. So the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit within you and are living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you will exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So those are the things that the Holy Spirit brings to us um, when we allow it to come and influence us. And, and when we spell Galatians correctly. And when we spell Galatians correctly, yes. Well, you know. All right. So, um, and yes, now we're, we're ready for our summing up. Do you want to do this or do you want me to? Um, One more, Joe. So the thing that, as we started to work on this presentation uh, a while back, the thing that was really interesting to me was how much I was learning that I didn't know about the concept of the Holy Spirit being present both in the Judaic and Islamic traditions uh, as well as, as Christianity. And so it really, thinking about it that way, actually really does give me a different appreciation of the interrelationship of the three Abrahamic faiths um, in a way that we don't fully appreciate. Um, and in a way that, uh, Education for Ministry does have a very strong emphasis on reminding Christians of the foundation of Judaism on which Christianity was built. I liked this review of the Holy Spirit because I think we ought to be thinking more carefully also about the relationship between Christianity and Islam and, and to recognize that we do have parts of a shared uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, some of the public commentary um, over the past months about Islam has really driven us away from keeping hold of the thought that uh, we do in many respects share faith foundations. Um, the other important concept we talked about here um, is the idea that in Christianity, um, the Holy Spirit has developed from being an attribute of God to a person of God, which is a very real substantial difference um, when you slow down and think about it, um, that the Holy Spirit is, is merely something that God gives to people is a different idea than that, that notion that the Holy Spirit is an integral part of God um, in God's person. And so is a manifestation um, rather than just a trait. And that makes a big difference in how we think about um, the Holy Spirit and how we um, relate with it. Um, an interesting question that came up recently in, um, I believe it was one of the um, Easter Tide meditations, the daily meditations from the, um, from the National Cathedral was, who do you pray to? You know, what, what do you say when you begin to address God um, in prayer. And it does it make a difference to you? And, and it's something just to think about, I think. And I've been kind of contemplating this. Do you think about God differently if you pray to God or if you say, dear Jesus, or if you address the Holy Spirit? Would that make a difference in how you pray or what you pray for? Um, and so that's one of the ways in which thinking about the, the, the triune God um, very practically in our lives um, is, is to think about it in that way. And um, what does that mean when we talk to the, the Holy Spirit, vice the Father or the Son? Um, the associations with language is um, something that I think is really striking. And um, again, that link between language and prophecy um, and most of uh, it, it, for me, it was a good reminder that a lot of the beautiful language associated with the Holy Spirit explicitly um, is prophecy. 
the Magnificat is not just a song of praise to God, it's a prophecy. Um, you know, Simeon is, is giving a prophecy, Anna's giving a prophecy. And so we see that link back to the Judaic tradition where the Holy Spirit comes and inspires prophets. Um, but we also, again, in those prophecies in Luke in particular, <coughs> we see the broadening out of the promise so that the prophecy is no longer just for the Jews, but is for all people um, as long as they come to believe. <coughs> and then the um, final point that we wanted to stress was just that if you're interested in the Holy Spirit and in pneumatology, um, the place where you will get the broadest concept is in Paul's letters, not in the Gospels per se, but that that does mean that there is controversy around the idea, just as there is controversy about a lot of things in Paul's letters. Um, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about how the church should treat women because of what Paul says in his letters. And so um, wherever you fall on that spectrum of thought about Paul, it, it's clear that um, his writings have had huge influence in the development of um, not just the structure of the church in terms of his church planting and his letters to them, but in terms of the theology and the concepts that we sometimes just take for granted. Be happy to have questions. I threw that one in. <laughs> Very nice. That, that was last month ago. Well, no, does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, I would like to know what would the result be if we just totally abandoned the concept of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Interesting thought. We wouldn't be Unitarians or Trinitarians. We'd be Duitarians. What, what would we be? <laughs> well, I, I'm not talking about words. I mean what would the impact be on the Christian faith? Good question, Susan. It, it's, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, my first thought is that it would be, for me, and this is cut off the top of my head, for me, it would be very hard to think about God in my life from day to day. Because for me, um, even if I'm not explicitly praying to the Holy Spirit in my prayer life, I am asking God to use the Holy Spirit and use that person of God to help me, to guide me, to lead me. Um, for me, it, it very much, um, it's easier it's in a lot of ways to relate to God as Holy Spirit than to relate um, to, to one of the other persons of God. Um, this brings up another point that we didn't touch on, but that sometimes, um, especially I think more of late as we have tried to address again and again, the role of women in the church um, and whether, you know, whether we go with what Paul seemed to indicate or not, is that there's, an also, there's also a lot of tradition that identifies the Holy Spirit with uh, wisdom, the concept of wisdom, which in Greek is Sophia and is a feminine concept. And so I think for some women, um, and to some extent for me, um, when I'm trying to, it's very hard for me. Uh, we talk about God the Father and God the Son. Those are both male. Even if we say intellectually, oh, God does, does not have a gender, those words are male. And so sometimes for me, the Holy Spirit is an easier way to access um, the feminine aspect of the Godhead. Yeah, I would also think theologically, if <clears throat> eliminating the concept of the Holy Spirit uh, as it exists in current Christian tradition means that you actually have to come up with a new theory of incarnation. Uh, uh -huh. Because that, that yeah. in my mind, is the primary function of the Lord, the giver of life. That is the Holy Spirit. And uh, so if you don't understand that incarnation of God to be breathing life or, or the giver of life, um, that's a pretty profound hole to leave in Christian theology that we'd have to make up for somehow. 
represent Ray Isaac here. I I have I have, I have a uh, somewhat heretical view of the Trinity generally, but in any case, my feeling the Holy Spirit is the communication to me to people what have you primarily, and so it's abs it's very necessary. Uh, in ancient times, we have references that God spoke <clears throat> directly to an occasional person for important purposes. But basically, uh, essentially, the Holy Spirit was the uh, the communication to the to the prophets, to what have you, and nominally, if we want to get it that way, to us today. I, I look at that as as the the uh, to us the input communication. We may pray. To God, or we may pray to Jesus, but it's the Holy Spirit that might talk to us. That's actually, I mean, I don't know. Joe can tell you whether you're a heretic or not, um, but to me, that <laughs> to me, that's very that's a very respectable view, simply because that is largely the Judaic view that the Holy Spirit was a means that God used to connect with persons, um, and so. It's certainly, you've certainly got um, centuries and centuries and centuries of tradition on your side, Ray. Yeah, Ray, Ray I would point out two things. One is you have revealed yourself as an Eloist, uh, since that <laughs> and it was the Eloist uh, ah. tradition uh, who basically says that, yes, uh, that is the Holy Spirit talking directly to people. The other thing that I would note to you, however, in the Judaic tradition is it's much more of a one-way channel. It's not the way people talk to God. It's the way God talks to people in the in the Jewish tradition. Hello, hi. Hello, this is Pam. Um, I'd like to please just make a comment or a question. Um, uh, what Ray just said, I think, is very important. And um, if no one, no pastor, no priest, no anybody, Jewish, um, Islamic, or Christian, told us about the Holy Spirit. Um, or the Trinity, we would know about it just by reading the Bible because we have the Father and then Jesus the Son. And then, as Jesus said, I'm going and I'm going to then send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we all know in our lives that um, the Holy Spirit is in our minds and hearts. Um, so, so we don't have to say, is there a Trinity? I mean, or debated or anything, in my opinion, because even if the Bible never mentioned the word Trinity, it mentions the Trinity throughout um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we don't have to really <laughs> worry about that. So, um, uh, um, and I, it's a very interesting what um, Mary was saying about how do we pray? Do we say Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, or all three? Um, is that, so those are um, my thoughts on it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Well, this um, is Judy. Oops. Go ahead, Judy. I, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, the spirit as exists, because I think each one of us has a spiritual aspect. And I also think that God and Jesus have that same aspect. And why can't the Holy Spirit just be their spirit extended to us from their own uh, from their own personal spirit. Why do we have to have a separate spirit? Why can't it just be an extension of Jesus and God both? Oh, that's, that's about a question. week. That's about a week worth of class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put you off, but I mean. There's all that. You know, the whole thing about, uh, I want to step back to Ray bit in a minute and give uh, Wade and Mary time to think of a succinct answer to your question. Look at me, jump that off to them. Um, but, but Ray, you, you write on with the, some of the modern theologians. Um, there's a woman, I can't think of her first name, but she was one of the first women ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church named Hayward. And her whole idea is that you know, the Holy Spirit is that connective force between people and between people and God. So the Holy Spirit is that thing that allows us to 
perceive God and tell, you know, without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't even know there is a God, you know, and we wouldn't be connected in the same way with each other, and certainly not with God. So, you know, it, it would be a really bleak world if, if we were kind of cut off from God in that way. Now, yeah, um, Pannenberg, another sort of modern theologian, talks about, you know, the energy, uh, God being a force, an energy force in our lives. And, you know, he's trying to think of a way that God can interact in our lives, even though God is outside of time and we're not. So he gets very scientific in the life. But the whole concept is, you know, the Holy Spirit is that force um, that allows us to connect to God and even tells us that God is there. It'd be a really crazy kind of world if there were no Holy Spirit. And then, you know, the whole bit about is is it one or two or three entities of God and what difference does that make? You know, I've come to think lately that, you know, having a Trinitarian aspect to God is really important. I didn't used to think that. I think it's important because, you know, God, how can God express love to God's self? That requires a, you know, this is Augustinian thinking, requires an object. Love requires an object, you know. And, and the idea that there's a co whole community of God, um, that out of that community of love that is God, love overflows and gets shared with us is a really comforting thing for us. That's my answer, but I know Wade, in particular, and Mary in particular, you will have, you know, different takes on all that. Yeah, you know, there's a, the very first sermon I ever preached in an Episcopal church was actually on the Trinity. Uh, and when I was writing that sermon, I discovered a book that I had known as a child that really gave me a different perspective on the Trinity. So the book is called Flatland, and it was written by somebody yeah. who was both a mathematician and an Episcopal theologian, Edward Abbott written about 150 years ago. And it's been normally thought of as a text that teaches children how to think about the second and third dimensions. Uh, and it relates the experience of people living in a two-dimensional world when a third dimensional person suddenly appears in front of them. And one of the things that's magic about it, uh, imagine holding up a sheet of paper, that's two dimensions, and imagine metaphorically sticking your hand through it. And at one point you'd see five circles, fingers appearing all sorts of different places, then that would merge into one circle. And uh, there are now a lot of people who think that Abbott was actually writing that book as an explanation of the Trinity. And the point that he's trying to make is that God is such an unbelievably complicated thought. You know, <laughs> all of creation, all of creation and yet cares individually about each of us that we have a very poor ability ourselves to describe all the ways we're experiencing God. And one way to think about the Trinity, according to Abbott, at least that's the way I've interpreted what Abbott wrote, is we're experiencing something that's so unbelievable, we just don't have the vocabulary to completely describe it. It is all one thing. We're experiencing it in lots of different ways. And, and, and that makes much more sense to me as a way of, uh, of interpreting the Trinity, and it also has the accompanying satisfying thought that if it's so complex I could never completely describe it, I won't worry about that fact. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of comfort to be found in saying that things are mysteries in, in Christian theology because that way I don't have to fret about them all the time. Um, to go back to, uh, in a little slightly lighthearted way, to the point Joe was making about there has to be an object for God's love, and so envisioning God in a Trinitarian manner gives God an object to put that love upon. Um, yeah, there was a great little um, meme from the Episcopal meme people um, that I saw yesterday that had one of those lovely, glorious pictures of the Trinity, you know, God, the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, and said, the Trinity, the only love triangle that really works. <laughs> That's good. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I thank you guys. I learned good stuff every time you come. 
And it's Thank good you, to Jeff. see you. And I think it's really prophetic and a Holy Spirit piece that both of you, but especially you, Mary, keep winking out on us while you're in. <laughs> I know. I love that. I can't wait to see how it shows up on the on the tape. Uh, the, the camera thinks th wants to think we're one thing, and then I get too far away. And... Yeah, I figure that the Holy Cross uh, nave is the background you put on your, your yes. computer, right? Yes, yes. It's a lovely church. So you're in different rooms? No, no, we're right oh. together. I didn't want to, I was afraid if we used two computers oh. that the sound would overlap. And so we're on, the, we're sitting side by side to use one computer. Um, otherwise, I think that like he, you know, like the sound from his computer would be picking up on my computer afterwards. It would be, it would be. But if you get too far away from the camera, you just kind of. Right. Yeah, we I need to be, we need to stay in the same plane in order <laughs> for the camera to think that we're one object. Uh -huh. <laughs> Like Flatland. Like the Abbott in Flatland, right? Yeah. 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 Anybody else have questions for these guys before we let them go? David. Okay. Hello, uh, Mary. Yes. I had a, a question or just to follow up on your, your uh, insightful comments about um, Paul and um, Sophia and wisdom. Um, we, Emily and I have looked at that through um, the dimension of Tekla's role in Paul and Tekla and that mm -hmm. she could potentially be, you know, a source of um, an influence on Paul in that regard. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, beyond saying, I, I agree, that's an interesting idea. Yes, that's about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, clearly, <sighs> Paul, Paul frustrates me because he writes things about women that we tend to interpret as being universal when he may, be, he may have been writing them about specific people in specific churches who were causing problems. Um, but clearly, on the other hand, there clearly are lots and lots of women involved in the early churches that he's writing to, and he includes women in the, the we, you know, the groups of people that he's talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I want to believe the best about Paul. And so I, I, I like your idea that, yes, he's being influenced by women and is, is himself not excluding um, specifically a, a feminine aspect of, of the Trinity, that there could be a, there must be, in fact, a feminine person there in order to make God not just some other male God um, of a pagan type. Yeah, I have a similar uh, set of conflicting reactions to, to Paul as, as Murray does, but one thing that I'll point out, it's largely through Paul's letters that we understand the leadership role that women actually played in the early church. Mm -hmm. So um, I find it hard to reconcile my own beliefs sometimes with some of the things that Paul says uh, about women, if, if they are meant to be taken generally. Uh, on the other hand, you have to give Paul credit for the fact that uh, if uh, the women didn't vanish, you know, their leadership role is actually pretty evident when you read Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'll clap thank you for having us, guys. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Hope to see you thank in you. person oh, next time. Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> you do lunch. I right. looked out... Uh, on the in the chapel grounds and there was five or six people 10 feet apart having a worship service impromptu kind of cool. very good got to yeah. do it how we can do it that's, yeah that's coming the bishop put out the rules yesterday so we'll take a look it, it all involves starting with 14 days of numbers downturning and we right hit that yet but as soon as we do we know. okay Bye. Thank Bye you. Guys. Really appreciate Bye. it. Bye. So here we are, guys, all dressed up. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> Not dressed up. <laughs> well, I am. You know, I would. I wouldn't slight you guys. Yeah. Very nice. Uh huh. I saw, like that meme. You know, I saw some guys in, here on campus in suits, collars. <laughs> And uh, short pants, <laughs> <laughs> sneakers.
the top half that shows. <laughs> yeah. So before I hear leaving, you know that Gimon's flight was canceled, yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's why he could participate in the service yesterday. He was sitting in the kitchen that's in the house that our new offices are in. And you can tell it's not there anymore because I moved it and hid it. There was a flamingo sort of thing behind his head. That was a hint. The flamingo was the name of the coffee bar at the scene. There's flamingos everywhere. Oh, and I found, believe it or not, in the house that we had been in, a package that had been unopened that the previous owners left. And it looks like it's two flamingo ghosts. They're black instead of pink. You can see their bone structures. So of course I assembled them and put them up in the house, but I don't I don't mean that in a bad way. I gotta see how that plays here. But it was so funny. Sort of an anti flamingo thing, you know? No, no. I'd love to know what prompted them to get that to get that. <laughs> So how are you guys doing? Okay. Yeah, FCS I call that flat butt syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> I got wireless microphones on though, so I could walk around during the service a little bit. <sighs> hey Kathy. Hey Jay. Joe. Hey. Do you um are you guys moving into the new office today? No, we're already moved. Oh my goodness. Wow. And, and yay, the thing is, uh, they come and move the copier tomorrow and then, and then they move, I'm not sure which order this is, I suspect they'll all be late and they'll end up with you there at the same time. But the Comcast guys are coming tomorrow too, all of this thanks to Ken arranged it for us. Um, and they're gonna move our phone line and set up our internet, you know, our Comcast internet connection. There's no internet connectivity in the house right now. Bye, guys. And so, you know, until that happens, we won't have connection. Okay. Are you on the ground floor? We're on the whole ground floor, unfortunately. Now, here's the good news. I scoped this out with, with you in mind, Lou. There's yeah. three steps to the porch, and there's tall ones. And then there's one step into the house. So clearly you can't come in the front door last. But there's a way in the back, you know. And I hate that. And it's over a cement sort of, not cement, a brick patio and the like, you know. And I haven't checked it out real thoroughly. There might be stuff there too. I just hate that. So we're going to have to figure out, you know, how we. Yeah, so I have to go fix through that. the kitchen. <laughs> have to go about. No, there's no kitchen. I mean, you can, but really, there's another couple other entrances, you know. Okay. And um, and it's just too bad because back in 1842, they didn't think of these things. Like yeah. That, you know? yeah, like in Old Town, some of the places we go, I have to go through the kitchen. Oh, dude, I hope that means they give you something good in a kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> A okay. freebie, something. Hold out. <laughs> Make friends with the chef, the and, sous chef. Yeah, that's right. Yesterday's plan for um, distributing jobs for the eventual move to the new building. Are you going to reschedule or? Yeah, I'm thinking about Saturday, but I have to check with some people to see if they're available. Um, but it gives you some more time to look it over, see where your name is, you know. And um, if you can think of, if your name isn't on there, and you can think of a way you can help, you know, like maybe, maybe there, who knows, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Maybe, you know, we could say to you, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we move the Gaudi play stuff in your van? You know, who knows? Um, gotcha. Yeah, we'll okay. Just see. Yeah. And it's all going to be tricky, but we now know how much it's going to cost us, you know, about $1,500 to move our offices from here to our new place. Oh, okay. Was that budgeted? But no, well, now it is, because we, you know, we didn't know, but it cost us 1600 uh, to move our offices here. And I explained yesterday, the bulk of that was the movers. And um, I decided to hire movers when it was clear 
the two people that were going to move us from the seminary didn't have concession equipment, and they would have gotten hurt. And they Thank just, goodness we did. just wouldn't have worked. And I couldn't live with that, you know. Yeah. And I'm glad because the guy who owns the moving company, we know <clears throat> he was a parishioner of ours. So he moved. And he's the guy who moved the cross for us for free. Uh -huh. Where it's in storage, and he's probably going to move it back to the city now that we paid him to come and get Anything else? We're good. Yeah, we're good. Thank you so much for Sunday school, Gay, you and Chris. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Bye. 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 Bye bye. Bye. Good to see you all be. You read so well. And, you know, Larry ended up with, you ended up with it, but you both read incredibly well. It was good to see Larry. Yeah, and he's such a gift, you know. I know for a fact, by the way, Jonathan contacted him and said, Mr. Dodd, would you be willing to read a small reading? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was happy to get the small reading. <laughs> yeah. Larry, you got to be kidding. Small reading. But he did it. It was really cute. He and Game On are having a good time. Good. <laughs>